Adhikarna 2. Mind merges in prana. Doubt. It is well understood that in the text, speech is withdrawn into the mind. What is intended to imply is the withdrawal of the functions. Now, as regards the succeeding text, the mind into the vital force, Chandogya 686, is it the withdrawal of the functions alone that is meant here as well? Or is it the withdrawal of the possessor of the functions? Opponent. When under such a doubt, the conclusion should be that the withdrawal of the possessor of the functions is meant here, since this view is supported by Upanishadic texts, and since the vital force can well be the material cause of the mind. Thus we have, O amiable one, the mind is derived from food, that is, earth. Food is derived from water, Chandogya 654, where the scripture mentions the mind as originating from food and food from water. There occurs also the Upanishadic text, and water created food, Chandogya 624. So to say that the mind merges in the vital force is the same as to say that food itself merges in water, for food is mind, and water is the vital force, since a material cause and its transformations are the same. Vedantin. This being the position, we say, Sutra 3, Tanmana prana utarat, tat, that, manaha, mind, merges, prane, in the vital force, utarat, as revealed in the subsequent text. Translation. That mind merges in the vital force as is revealed in the subsequent text. From the subsequent portion of the text cited above, it is to be understood that when this mind merges in the vital force, it does so through the absorption of its functions alone, together with the functions of the external organs that are withdrawn into it. Thus it is that when a man wants to sleep or is about to die, the activities of the mind are seen to cease even while the function of the vital force, consisting in its vibration, respiration, still persists. Besides, the mind as such cannot merge into the vital force, since that is not its material source. Opponent. Have we not shown that the vital force is the material cause of the mind? Vedantin. That is not valid, for it is not logical that the mind should merge into the vital force in accordance with the above ratiocination. For even so, the mind would have to be absorbed into food, that is, earth, food into water, and the vital force too into water. But even from such a standpoint, no proof can be adduced to show that the mind originates from water transformed into vital force. Hence, the mind as such does not get absorbed into the vital force. It was also shown earlier that the text can fit in, even if the merger of the functions is meant. For the functions and the possessor of the functions are figuratively understood to be the same. Namaste. So, the text of Brahma Sutra and especially the commentary by Shankaracharya, the Shariraka Bhashya, meaning the commentary by one who is embodied. Now, how does the body form in the first place? Well, it's similar to the process of creation, which is narrated in several Vedic scriptures. And by the way, each of these narrations is unique and different <laughs> to show us that the creation doesn't really matter that much because it's virtual. It's illusory. 
It's temporary and so unreal. But, of course, we think it's real because we're identified with the body and mind. So the body is made of material elements, and those elements are based on the subtle elements, which are the functions of the elements. For instance, akasha, space. Space makes room for everything. It makes a location available for things to exist and stuff to happen. Whereas, for example, fire generates light, which reveals form, and so on. Each of the elements has not only a matter aspect, but also a function aspect. The difference is similar to hardware and software. The hardware is the body, the material, the stuff, while the software is the function of that stuff. So in the same way, at the time of death, the process of creation is reversed. And the, while the hardware <laughs> of the body, the material elements of the body, merge into their causes in reverse order of the creation, the functions can merge into things which are not their material causes. I guess I should mention here that in the process of creation of the material elements, each material element becomes the material cause of the next grosser element. For example, space becomes the cause of fire, fire becomes the cause of air, and so on. So as the elements become more and more gross, they also acquire more and more qualities. For example, Earth, being the grossest element, has all five qualities. Smell, taste, touch, sight, and sound. Whereas space, being the most subtle element, only has sound. Space is the medium of transmission of vibration. Whereas the earth not only has vibration and all the other effects, but it also has a function of smell, odor, which is a very complex phenomenon capable of transmitting a lot of information. So the difference is that in the process of death, this is reversed, whereas the elements simply merge into the other elements. The functions that those elements are used for merge into their respective causes, which are different. For example, the text has been going over the fact that the functions of the sense organs merge into the mind. But then where does the mind merge? Into the vital force. Now, this is not an issue, this is not a function in the ordinary material creation, because it's not alive. It has no vital force, or its vital force operates in extremely constricted ways. Whereas living bodies, when they die, they have functions that a non-living matter does not possess. See? So what happens to those functions? Where do they go? Well, they go into the part of the living entity that is not present in ordinary dead matter. That is the living force. Prana is part of the living force. But the living force is more than just prana, which is based on air. And it's more than just light or consciousness, which is based on fire. The mind is based on fire. It is something transcendental. It is consciousness. So this consciousness is the actual root cause 
of the body and the mind, the material existence and the life uh, that is lived through the material body. But it is not the life itself. Life is a function. A body is an object. Life is subtle. The body is gross. Life is like software. The body is like hardware. And the life, just like a computer program, executes in a given hardware setup. So also the life energy, the prana, courses through the material elements of the body to give them the functions that appear to be like the inputs of the senses, hearing, sight, and smell, taste, and touch. So all of these things are going on at the time of death. The time of death is the most critical time, the most important time of your life. Why is that? Because at the time of death, the impetus, the cause of the next body is finalized. So whatever is appearing in your mind, in your imagination, by your intention, at the moment of death, becomes the primary force that sets in motion the creation of the next body. That's why it's so important to live a life based on spiritual realization. To remember the self, Brahman, and God, and all these Vedic truths regularly to form many, many impressions of transcendental quality, information which is linked ultimately to consciousness and Brahman. Because what happens at the time of death, that when the mind is reabsorbed into the element of fire, all of these impressions go with it. And I've used the analogy many times of creating a zip file. When you have a bunch of information, you want to send it over a slow internet connection. You have to compress it, isn't it? And then that file can be sent over even a slow connection successfully and decompressed at the destination. So in the same way, the impressions of the current life are compressed into a seed. And that seed then travels with the prana to the next body, where it is decompressed, as it were, into the living being of the next life. So this is the process of death. And one should understand this process so that when it does occur, one can deal with it effectively. And throughout the life, one should understand this process of death and rehearse for it. How do you do that? Well, every night when you fall asleep, the same process happens. But when you fall asleep, the process is reversible. At the time of death, the process is irreversible. So we have a chance to practice, and the time of going to sleep at night is one of the most important times of meditation. Also waking up in the morning, because when we're waking up in the morning, it's like the process of creation. And when we go to sleep at night, it's like the process of death where everything is wound up and compressed, absorbed into the mind, and then the mind is absorbed into its source. Some say fire is the source of the mind. Some say space is the source of the mind. I think both of them have merit because fire gives light and light is present in dreams. In dreams, we perceive forms, even though there's no physical light. But the principle or the function of light is there 
therefore fire is there. So it makes sense to assume that this part of the mind is absorbed into fire. Whereas the higher part of the mind that visualizes structure and relationships and stuff like abstract concepts is based on space. That would be the higher part of the mind or the intelligence. So I think what's really going on here is that the text doesn't distinguish between the mind and the intelligence. So sometimes it's said that the mind is withdrawn into fire and sometimes into space. That's the origin of the discussion and the misunderstandings of the opponent in the text, huh? <laughs> the so-called opponent, which I suppose Shankaracharya had experienced these arguments in the many debates that he held in public to establish his philosophy in India. So this is the actual truth about death. This is something no doctor can tell you, no psychologist or psychiatrist can understand, because they're not yogis. They don't observe the movements of consciousness the way a yogi does. But if you do, then all of these things become well, just obvious. Huh? Because you watch as you go through the changes in the states of consciousness. And these become the background for you to approach death and deal with it successfully, leading to complete liberation. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.